Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shanyavari Paschachate Shatarine Vanchakalpata Rubyascha Kripasindu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hedyo Vaishnavityo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Ghor Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada explains to us that our spiritual life actually begins when we chant the Hare Krishna mantra. The chanting of Hare Krishna is so important that it awakened. I don't The chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is so important and so powerful that it begins our spiritual life for us. Our consciousness is actually meant to be spiritual, but we have contacted the material energy since time immemorial. It is explained that there are two kinds of souls. There are Nitya Buddha souls, and Nitya Mukta souls. Nitya Mukta souls reside eternally in the spiritual world and they're free from all kinds of illusion and anxiety. They live in the spiritual world. We often refer to the spiritual abode as being Vaikuntha, the place of no anxiety. We live in the material world, which is a place of anxiety. You have to take him out. So the material realm is full of anxiety. It is the nature of this world. It is not meant to be a very enjoyable place for us. But this is the material world. We are called Nitya Bada, eternally conditioned souls. Conditioned to think of ourselves in terms of the material body. We identify ourselves with the material body. We are thinking, I am Indian, or I am Hindu, or I am man, or I am woman, I am black, I am white, I am young, I am old. Like this, we look at ourselves and we identify with the material, with the external. But the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is meant to bring about a change in our consciousness. We're meant to come out of that conditioned existence and come to the platform of spirituality, the transcendental platform. So the Maha Mantra has that power. It is full of spiritual energy. When we present the Krishna conscious philosophy to our youth, like sometimes we go into colleges, universities, and we will present to them the Krishna consciousness philosophy, we will teach them to chant Mahamantra, then at that time 
we will explain to them how by chanting this maha mantra we can feel the whole atmosphere transformed that it becomes surcharged with spiritual potency the maha mantra has that effect our scriptures describe the holy name of krishna as being chintamani some of you may have read the chaitanya charit amrita it's bengali classic but it's an important bhakti shastra it's written by a great devotee named krishna das kaviraj and he has described he has quoted many verses from different scriptures one of the verses which he quotes is describing the power of the holy name Nam Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vikraha Purna Shuddha Nitya Mukta Bina Nam Nama Nama That the holy name of Krishna is described as being Chintamani. Now Chintamani is not just simply something which transforms uh, stone or metal into gold. But the Chintamani, the holy name is described as Chintamani in the sense that it can fulfill all of our material desires. Do any of you have any material desires? Maybe. If we're honest, you know, I think we, we have desires. So the chanting of the Maha Mantra can help us to actually satisfy our spiritual desires. It's not wrong to desire, but the problem is the quality of our desires. We often find that the quality of our desires is not very good, it's not very high. We think, you know, we desire, maybe we desire wealth, we desire power, we desire fame. One time, uh, I was staying in our temple in Hong Kong, and we were visited by one Indian couple. The lady herself was in Bollywood. She was in films, you know? So she came to His Holiness, the Mao Krishna Goswami, who was the senior most devotee there at that time. And she placed herself at his feet and she begged him, please, Swami Maharaj, can you bless me that I will become famous? So, you know, that was her desire. Of course, if one is a little more intelligent, and thinks about this, you think, well, how long are you going to be famous for? You know, maybe you make one film and you become famous, but how many more films can you go on to make? You know, even if you're, uh, you know, different Bollywood stars are there, how long do they last? How long does their fame last? Of course, they're all going to die, they're going to give up their body, they're going to retire one day. Maybe they'll get a place in the Bollywood Hall of Fame. So they may get the, their picture in the Bollywood Hall of Fame, but I don't know if that would qualify them to go back to Godhead. We don't know what would be their destination in the next life. Somehow, on account of their karmic activity, they may have acquired some success, material success, got some name or fame in this material world, but it's finished with the body. And when the body's finished, then the soul will take birth again. As Lord Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, Ajo nityam shasvato yam purano na hanyate hanyamane shari. 
For the, for the soul, there is no birth and there is no death. Nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and primeval. He is not slain, even if the body is slain. We have to understand the nature of the soul. Chanting Hare Krishna is therefore immediately effective that we can begin to realize our spiritual nature as souls. We are all spiritual beings, we are all souls. And we can realize that when we begin to chant the Maha Mantra with faith and conviction. Immediately you can feel that consciousness awakening, how I am not the body, but I am simply living in the body. I am living in the body. Dehi no smenyata dehi, right? We live in the body. We are not the body itself, but we reside in the body. Just like you enter the home, or you enter the room. You don't become the room, you enter into the room. And similarly, the soul enters into the body. We become in, absorbed in the body. The conditioning is to think, I am the body. And because we're thinking, I am the body, we're thinking the goal of life is to satisfy our senses. But chanting Hare Krishna, brings about an awakening in consciousness. We begin to understand, I am not the body. I am a pure spiritual being. I am a soul. So, Nam Chintamani Krishna, Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha. Chaitanya, consciousness. We have consciousness. The consciousness is in the body because of the presence of the soul. When Srila Prabhupada went to the USA, at one point the devotees arranged a lecture for him at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now MIT, you know here in India we say, oh IIT, oh IIT, very great. If you can get into IIT, you're very great. But just imagine if you get into MIT. MIT is like the, the very top of the world, you know. It's the, it's the very cream of technology, the highest level of technology. And so Prabhupada went there and he gave a lecture. And different people came, you know, and all intelligent people. Some were academic staff and some were students. So Prabhupada was giving his lecture and he asked them, what is the difference between the living body and the dead body? And they tried to give different explanations, but they tried to explain in material ways. They tried to apply their material knowledge to understand life. And it was all futile. They could not properly explain the difference between the body and the soul. They could not explain the difference between the living body and the dead body. They thought, well, it's conscious. Due to the, there's no consciousness. But where is the consciousness coming from? That they did not know. But Srila Prabhupada could explain to them very clearly the consciousness is the symptom of the soul. We all have consciousness, and that consciousness is there in all living entities, in the trees, in the plants, in the animals, the birds, the fish, all different creatures. They all have consciousness to some extent, but it's covered according to the body. Different bodies will restrict 
the consciousness. We are fortunate that we have come to the human form of life. Therefore, Vedanta Sutra says, at ato brahma jignasa, that now you are in the human, atato meaning now, now you have the human body, now you should understand what is brahma jignasa, what is the knowledge of spirit and matter. This is not taught in colleges, in universities, anywhere in the world. We have to teach it. This ISKCON society is meant for that for teaching people the difference between matter and spirit, the difference between the body and the soul. So Srila Prabhupada explained that in the dead body, there is no soul. With that means the soul leaves the body. And of course the soul gives up one body, but then will take another body. It means that we'll will generally, the conditioned souls, the nitya bada, the conditioned souls, will remain conditioned. And according to their level of activities, they will take another body. Some who are in higher consciousness will be elevated to higher forms of life, or higher planets, like the heavenly planets or even at the top of the universe, you have Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and Satyaloka. These are all higher planetary systems. We're on the, in the middle of the universe, on Bhumandala, Buloka, the earthly planetary system. It's not too heavenly and it's not too hellish. It is considered the most appropriate place to become Krishna conscious. On the higher planets, there's so much sense gratification. It's very difficult to chant because there's so much attraction for the senses. Just like now you're living here in Bihar, in Patna. But maybe if you go to Mumbai and you see life in Mumbai, you think, oh, so much sense gratification. So many beautiful apartments, luxury apartments, and generally, you know, the more expensive items of living will be available there. So we, we may think it's more attractive to live there. But the more there is attraction for the material world, the less there can be attraction to Krishna consciousness. So it's better not to be in the higher planets, and also you don't want to be in the lower regions of the universe, because in the lower regions of the universe, it's so hellish. Yamaloka is there in the bottom of the Yamaloka. Yamaraj is punishing all the sinful people. So there's so many different hells there in the lower region. And there's no sunlight. How could you imagine living without the sun? It's all darkness. And the only light comes from jewels which they wear on their hands. So in this way, there's a lot of suffering in the lower regions. It also makes it very difficult to become God conscious. So the Acharyas tell us the best place to become God conscious is actually here on this earth planet, on Bharatvarsa. Of all this, on, all this, on all this planet, the best place on the planet is Bharat. Here, that you have a chance to cultivate Krishna consciousness without too much distraction and without too much suffering. It makes it very convenient for us to absorb ourselves in the chanting of the holy name. So chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is the fundamental requirement.
or Krishna consciousness. We begin our Krishna consciousness by chanting and we continue to chant. It's not that, oh, after some time we can give up the chanting. It's not that we chant for some time and then we become Krishna or merge with Krishna, but rather we continue to chant and the more we chant, the more we will take pleasure in the chanting. There were great devotees, associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, like Haridas Thakur. He was chanting every day. Uh, three lakhs names, meaning 192 rounds. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, who was the founder of the Godiamat and who was the spiritual master of the founder Acharya of Iskon, he had asked his disciples to chant 64 rounds a day because 64 rounds is one lakh names. So that was considered a good amount of chanting. They would chant you know, not always on the beach, but they would try to chant one lakh names every day. However, Srila Prabhupada, he went to the West to begin the Krishna consciousness movement. And we Westerners, we found it very difficult to chant so many rounds. So Srila Prabhupada gave us some concession. At first he said, then chant 32 rounds. But again, the Vokis said, oh, too much. So then Srila Prabhupada again gave concession and said, 16 rounds. You must chant 16 rounds. No reduction on that. Right? So Prabhupada fixed it at 16 rounds. Why 16 rounds? Well, just like sometimes when you're learning to write or read something, you, the, your teacher may tell you, write out this sentence 10 times. And you write out the sentence, and you write it out ten times. And by writing it out ten times, then it becomes implanted in your memory. And you can, you know, you know the sentence. So similarly, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, we have to chant repeatedly to fix it in our mind, to fix it in our brain. The chanting of the Maha Mantra is a prayer. It's a prayer to the Supreme Lord. Srila Prabhupada described it as, O Supreme Lord Krishna, O Supreme Energy of the Lord Hari, please engage me in your service. So it's a prayer, but it's also the answer to our prayer. It's an answer to our prayer because by chanting, we're being engaged in the service of so this chanting of the Maha Mantra is both the beginning of our Krishna consciousness and it's also the perfection of Krishna consciousness. By chanting the holy name, we can develop our love for God. That is the goal. Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would say, Prem Punartho Moham. The goal of life is to be, develop love for God. And how to develop that love for God is given through to us in the chanting of the holy names. Actually, it's stated that in this Kali Yuga, there is no other way. And it's well known, probably many of you, you all know this verse, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted the uh, Kali Santara Upanishads, which is Upanishads are from the Vedas. So it's a Vedic mantra. It's mentioned there. Iti so dasha kam nam nam kalikam asha nasanam mata para para upaya sadva vedi shudrishate. It's stated that these so dasha kam nam nam, 16 names. Do you know the 16 names? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, 
Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. How many? 16, right? These 16, Kito Dasha Kam Nam Nam, Kali Kam Masha Nasha Nam. They can, can remove the, all the dirt of this age of Kali, the Kali Yuga, a very unfortunate, inauspicious time. It's not very good. It, people are not very pious. We're not very religious in the Kali Yuga. We can see that even today, everywhere, people are eating all kinds of prohibited foodstuffs. Even in the villages today, people are eating all kinds of prohibited foodstuffs. And then there's so many other sins. Although the pillars of religion are mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is described that the pillars of religion are four Satyam, Sojam, Daya, Tapa. So, Satyam, truthfulness, that's destroyed by so much lying propaganda and by gambling. And then so jump cleanliness. Cleanliness is destroyed. People have become lazy. Not just only externally cleaning ourselves, but we have to clean ourselves internally also. So cleanliness is very important. There's a saying, cleanliness is next to godly. If we're going to practice godliness, we must be careful to keep clean. And cleanliness is, of course, destroyed by, in a, by improper, irreligious connection with the other sex. And that's very bad. So, satyam sojam daya, mercy. Mercy is destroyed by killing of other living entities, particularly animals. So, in the Krishna Consciousness Movement, we have prohibitions. No meat, no fish, and no eggs. You may say, well, what's wrong with eggs? Well, it's not the pure food. You don't hear about Lord Krishna ever having eggs. In the Vedic culture, there was no eggs. There were no people were not raising chickens as they do today. And also fish. Well, some people say all oh, fish is it's the fruit of the sea. This is the excuse for killing the unfortunate creatures who inhabit the sea. And, of course, animals, of course, also, it's not really meant to be food for human beings, civilized people, and be careful to be vegetarian. If we study the anatomy of the human body, then it's very clear that the body is designed to be vegetarian. We say herbivorous. We're not meant to be carnivorous. Carnivorous meaning meat eating. We're meant to be herbivorous. We're meant to eat leaves and vegetables. Of course, sometimes people may argue, well, are they not also life? Yes, they are also life. But there's a difference between the animals and the plants. There's a difference. Animals have a higher consciousness. When you kill the plants, which we generally do when they have com completed their life, we wait until the harvest, the time comes, it's an appropriate time when you harvest the grains and the plants and so on. But animals, we don't wait for them to die. Instead, they take them and kill them before, they're ready, before their life is over. 
but it's very simple. And particularly, it's most simple to kill the cow. Now, we're not promoting worship of the cow, but we do promote protection of the cow. That is the duty of the Vaishya. As described in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishi Goraksha Baninam Vaishya Karma Swabhavacham. Lord Krishna has mentioned that the duty of the Vaishya is to do business, trading, and farming and protection of the cows. We see when Lord Krishna appeared along with his brother Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram, he is called Kaladar. He carries the plow. Plow is used for till tilling the field. And also, you could say, preparing the ground to plant the seed of devotion in the heart of the devotees. And Lord Krishna, what does he carry? The flute, yes. The middle dar or Vamsidar. Lord Krishna is carrying the flute to call the cows. Because Lord Krishna came to enjoy the life of Vrindavan as a cowherd boy, taking care of the cows. So it's very important, the, the quality of daya, mercy. Don't eat the animal flesh and the fish and the eggs, these things. And we also say you should not eat onion and garlic. And you may say, well, these are vegetables. What's wrong? Onion and garlic. Is it so simple? Well, they are intoxicants. They are aphrodisiacs. They increase the, the lust. They stimulate the passion which is there in the body. We already have a lot of rajagun in the body. And if you take more onion and garlic, it will just simply increase that passion which is there in the body. And these things are not pure food for offering to Lord Krishna. You want to offer food to Krishna? You like to eat Krishna prasada? Lord Krishna doesn't eat onions and garlic. But he said garlic grew out of the dead cow. It's not meant for human consumption. But why do people eat these things? Simply for the satisfaction of their tongue. They like the taste. And similarly, why do they eat meat? They like the taste of blood. If you like the taste of blood, the proper way to taste blood is to drink the milk. The milk of the cow is a natural way in which we can taste the blood of the cow without causing any harm to the cow. Cow's milk is actually very helpful for us to develop a good brain. And with a good brain, you can understand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. It's unfortunate in the Kali Yuga, modern times, people don't like to drink milk. They say, give me Coca-Cola. <laughs> they don't know what is actually good and what is garbage. So, no meat, fish and eggs. We had, we had no gambling. We had no uh, such young, so junk cleanliness and diet. And then tapa, austerity. Tapa, austerity. Now, tapa does not mean that you should torture yourself. That is not required. <coughs> But tapa is destroyed by pride. We should become humble. We have to understand our spiritual position. We say our ego should be in proportion to our spiritual dimension. 
Our spiritual dimension, what is the size of the soul? One hundred of one hundred of the tip of a hair. In other words, it is very, very minute, very small. And our ego should be in proportion to that dimension of the soul. But unfortunately, we often find that our ego is in proportion to our body. I'm five foot eight, or I'm six foot, or whatever. So we have to give up that kind of false ego, the pride. There's another saying, pride comes before the fall. We become, we become proud and then we will fall again into material ignorance and illusion. So cultivating humility is very important. And, and that kind of tapa which is required, it's particularly pointed out we should avoid all kinds of intoxicants. Pride is one kind of intoxication. That's a subtle intoxication. But there are gross things which intoxicate us. Things like tea and coffee are intoxicants. Right? Srila Prabhupada told us in his whole life he never even drank tea. Not even a cup of tea. Any of you here ever could say that? You never ever drank a cup of tea in your whole life? Unlike most of we drink, we're brought up tea drinking. So, there's no tea in the spiritual world. You want to go back to Godhead? You won't get a cup of tea there. And there's no cup of coffee there. So, these things, these principles, they help us to develop more taste in the chanting of the Holy Name. When we follow these principles carefully, it helps us to have more appreciation for the spiritual power of the Holy Name. Everyone can benefit by chanting the Holy Name. Some people, of course, may say, well, I'm not a vegetarian, so can I still chant the holy name? Yes, you can. And if you keep chanting, one day you will become a vegetarian. And if you don't become a vegetarian, one day you will stop chanting. That's what will happen. Because... We want to develop the real taste or the appreciation for the holy name. So the chanting of the Maha Mantra is so important for all of us. We have to develop that relationship with Krishna. And we know Krishna through his name. Lord Chaitanya kindly gave us eight prayers which we call the Shikshastika, by which we can properly understand the Holy Name. And in one of the prayers, he's told us that we should constantly chant the Holy Name. Hmm? Yeah? Okay. All right. So... We have to stop here now because we're going to hear from Srila Jakitaka Swami Maharaj. I think that's why you all came. You're not here to hear me. You came to hear me. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. So we'll go upstairs and we'll hear. Hi. Hi. 
We all came here to hear from the lotus mount of His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinas Narasimha Maharaj Ki Jai! Thank you very much, very enlightened Maharaj. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's correct. Uh, so because what happened in 30 minutes here in this hall, after 30 minutes, uh, exactly at 8 o'clock, it will be the official reception by all the ISKCON partner devotees. Here will, will be different programs happening every day. Now, tomorrow will be a different program happening in the evening. But today, all the local devotees, all of you, we are going to receive and welcome officially Sila Jayapataka Swamis, the, the spiritual safari, all the sannyasis at 8 o'clock. So now, we are going now to the 6th floor, all, only safari devotees, okay? Not everybody, okay? Only safari devotees, we're going to the roof of the guest house right now, um, on, on the sixth floor, and then we're going to come with him after 25 minutes. We're going to have just a small 10-15 uh, minutes gathering because the 